morning or good evening or wherever you are in this world. Let's wait a, a couple more minutes here. And then uh, I guess we got everyone actually. We've got Andres here. We got everyone here. Love it. Uh, Damien, of course. Of course he's here. Got AR Drive, by the way. Whoever uh, hasn't watched Andrew's um, video on AR Drive, go, go look at it now. It's, it's amazing. It's like 10 out of 10. I saw that today. Yeah, isn't it just, really good. Isn't it just amazing? I feel like, oh my God, like you do that, I don't know, once a week, once every two weeks. It's just so entertaining. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, what is this Ari stuff? I love it. Love it. Can't wait to see the next one. Yeah, it was particularly funny for me. We were planning on... Um, on having some of the team go to that particular conference. And we were like thinking, oh, where is the permanent storage overlap here? Like how, how can we actually sort of like make an impact and, uh, and then possibly like get some new users um, from this. Um, it, it seemed like he had, uh, you know, as much trouble as you might expect, which is kind of why, where the comedy of the video came from, I think. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think, I think it was the, a great approach, you know, like, and you can use this for every single real life situation. I mean, it was great. Even like the trash can thing at the end. You know, it was like, oh, look, this is the, the what it was the opposite of the metaphor for, I don't know. It was just great. Everything, the USPS thing, which by the way, I still haven't got my, my R AR drive t-shirt, but that's okay. And, um, you know, I mean, it was just great all around. Loved it. Loved it. I told Andrew that yesterday we were on the call. I think he got tired of me saying it, but it's okay. That's okay. I'm not going to stop. All right, cool. I think everyone's here so we can, you know what, let's get going. All right. So before, um, before we start, uh, this is episode number two. If you haven't watched episode or watched, if you haven't listened to episode number one, I guess you can go back onto, um, our weave news and listen to it. We had, we had like the greatest, well, not the greatest, but we had an amazing, uh, guest, which was Sam Williams from our weave. Um, very, very great listen if you haven't listened to that. Um, so we'll we'll go ahead and kick it off with uh, with I guess a little presentation. You know who's who here. Um, Andres, I'm, I'm assuming you're Spanish, since Andres, you know, if you'd like to give um, or maybe not Spanish but Latin, maybe um, if you'd like to give a little presentation about yourself, real quick. You know, let's 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 greet everyone, then we can get uh, get started. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, you're. Your assumption is correct. I'm Hispanic. I'm from a country called Venezuela. Ah. And I'm Andres. Um, I'm the founder for for the XM. Been working on the XM for the past year. Um, and before that, I was already part of the of the R with ecosystem with 3EM. Really exciting project that still powers um, many applications, including the XM, as of today. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me and looking forward to this insightful conversation about our weave. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, Henry, would you like to go and uh, have a crack at it? You're not introducing me this time. I thought you, you were the one who were to give me that great intro. So <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Henry. Uh, I'm a so the social media strategist of, of our weave news, uh, and I'm Romain's co-host. That's why I was hoping he would introduce me, but he's letting me do the hard. I guess work. I'll introduce myself while Henry gets his mic issues sorted. Um, I'm Xylophone or Benjamin. I'm the founder of our weave news and Permacast. Um, hopefully this these will be going up on Permacast. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, that would be amazing. Um, all right, cool. So I'm I'm Romain. I'm here with uh, with uh, Evervision. I'm part of branding. I'm just you know here to host a little bit of a little space, learn more about our weave. Uh, before we get started, I just want everyone to know, like I so today, in you know imagine, let's just imagine I fell right and I hit my head on the floor and I don't remember anything about our weave, right? So that's what like. Andres, get ready, because I don't know anything about anything, okay? I'm going to ask you all the basic questions. So whoever here doesn't know much about Arweave or much about EXM or whatever, don't worry. I got you because I don't know anything either because, um, you know, I fell, hypothetically speaking. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. Henry, um, hopefully you did get your mic fixed because um, you can, you know, go on and uh, get started with, uh, with this week's news or last week's news, rather. So I'm not sure if the technical issues have been solved, but I'm hoping you guys can hear me. 
loud and clear perfecto 10 out of 10 perfect amazing to hear that so i can't hear him paul <laughs> oh wait you can't hear him at all wait um let's see let's ask a random oliver can you hear um, our friend henry here yeah i can hear henry okay okay so huh. that's where no. can everyone hear henry that's an interesting issue yeah, that is. I've never had that one before. Uh, maybe Joe, if you would like to, you know, a little emoji if you heard uh, Henry. By the way, hi, Joe. Well, I'm oh, gonna every, okay, so. and rejoin. <laughs> yeah, everyone's everyone's thumbs up in here. Everyone's sending a little thumbs up. So, I mean, maybe Silo, maybe maybe we got an issue here. But yeah, let's let him uh, rejoin. And while we rejoin, you know, for the new listeners that are coming in here. Um, Let's just explain a little bit how this is going to end up going. So we're ha we have three segments here. First one will be to uh, basically tell the news what's happening in our weave. Second part will be we'll be going to deep conversation with our beautiful friend Andres from from Venezuela. I assume he knows I speak Spanish as well, just because I said his name properly. And then on the third, we'll go uh, to, or the third section rather, uh, we'll go and uh, finish off with Arwe's Voice contest winner, which that will uh, be uh, be uh, Henry that will be doing. All right, so Henry, are you good now? I'm hoping I'm good. You are amazing. Amazing. I, I hear you so crispy, very crispy. All right, I'll let you get on with the first section, Arweave News and Developments. Perfect. Thank you. So we're starting off the session strongly. This week, we found out about Solana hosting their decentralized mobile application store on Arweave. Uh, it's an exciting development for the ecosystem. And to me, the most important part is the fact that other chains and uh, other networks are using Arweave and recognizing Arweave as the de facto permanent storage solution for Web3. Now, the next news we have on the list is the first implementation of render with. Now, I'm not sure exactly if people know what render with is. Um, it's a new or existing uh, mechanism to actually tell our weave gateways to render a content. So think of it this way. Right now, all the content on our weave is a blob of text, right? with which smart contracts or other applications take it, process it, and render it to you. But right now, there's a tag in, that can be associated with all transactions that instructs the Arweave gateways to actually render your content and show you what you want to see in that transaction. And Andres being the most technical of us here, I'd like to ask him exactly what Arweave and what the possibilities of the render with standard are today to render as in as in sharing information from the gateway yes exactly yeah so i mean right now and that's one of the one of the things that i really like about about the arif gateway and i think this will be all improving with the new gateways projects that are coming um, right now, it's not it's not only text, but you you can through the gateways you can you know you can show you can retrieve videos, pictures, PDFs. Um, so I'm very like I'm very interested on in how this new thing is gonna is gonna play out. Um, I'm definitely not fully familiar with this new standard, but. Um, I think with the new projects, the, the gateways with the RIO team um, working on this on these new gateways projects for for Arweave, I think it's definitely going to play a role in the way we perceive Arweave, especially the the ease of use. Um, if you go to Filecoin, if you go to you know other systems, there's always this I guess this this problem with like latency or the way you retrieve data or the way you you actually interact with the data, which is a problem that I haven't seen in, in our brief. Just look at it, you know, we have like the the GraphQL and we have like all these abilities as, as you mentioned, to render and actually give the user what the user wants. So it's very interesting what it's playing out. Awesome, thank you. 
Now, next up on our news list uh, is WeaveDB's pre-seed round. If you guys haven't heard, they raised $900,000 to build out the Firestar of Web3. Now, congratulations to the team. It's great to see that at, even in the bear market, great projects get recognized and manage to get funding to grow and to assist the RVV ecosystem in, in growing. Now, the next item on our list is the Pianity and MetaMask integration. I'm not sure if you heard about this, but starting from last week, you can now connect to Pianity using your MetaMask wallet. And you can also see in Pianity the items you have stored on the Ethereum chain. So basically, you can now use an Ethereum chain wallet to connect to an Rweave dApp. The great part about this is think about the possibilities of having MetaMask, which is, to my knowledge, the largest decentralized wallet for any of your dApps. The good part is the team is not stopping there, but it's also planning on evolving this integration with MetaMask and making it possible to actually see both your Rweave and Ethereum assets in one place. So congrats to the team for the integration. Andres, I'm not sure if you were aware of this news, but do you have any comments? I did hear of it. Um, it's something really excited, you know, because I feel like all the projects right now in Rweave, Rweave being, you know, this small ecosystem that's constantly growing exponentially, um, it's still small, you know, in comparison to other ecosystem, but it's growing. I think like Arweave is the fastest growing ecosystem in my opinion. Um, I haven't seen any other ecosystem with such a strong community and, and such a strong projects and use cases as Arweave. So seeing this this partnership between the Redstone team and, and MetaMask is is really it's really nice for many reasons, for a variety of reasons. I, I'd say the first is because Arweave. And the Arif people, the Arif projects, were really dedicated to creating real use cases. We're really dedicated to creating this bridge, you know, Web 2, Web 3. We're really dedicated to growing the Arif ecosystem. So seeing this playing out in MetaMask, seeing MetaMask having an interest in Arif, is just reassurance of where the Arif ecosystem is going. It tells you something. It tells you that the Arif ecosystem is onto something. Um, just having this, you know, these big projects out there like MetaMask um, playing out a role in the development of of the Arweave ecosystem in one way or the or, or another. It's really reassurance not only for the users of the Arweave ecosystems, the end user, but also for the developers that are constantly creating. So it's you know it's definitely it's definitely a really good news, especially um, at this stage of of the RF ecosystem in the market in general. I have to say, I fully yeah. agree. And I'm just thinking about the possibility of exposing the RWEF projects and applications to the wider Web3 community and making it frictionless for them to actually join and use the product we're building, which to me is really fantastic. Which I think that's been like, you know, the main, the main idea of doing has had in their mind in the RBF ecosystem, at least for the past year. The question hasn't been about how do, how do we create a cool project? The question has always been about, at least for the past year, as I said, has always been about how do we, how do we improve the user experience? How do we um, remove all these friction lines that a user constantly face? Um, so, you know, seeing a big project such as uh, MetaMask coming from Ethereum into our reef, um, you know, it really, I think it's really interesting to see that um, because like when you think of Ethereum, Ethereum is like this, this isolated ecosystem, super big with a really strong community, you know, uh, really steady, really strong community. So it, it almost makes you wonder, wow, like our reef is doing something right to get Ethereum looking at us, you know? Fully agree. And to that point, and to what- oh, you Wait, wait, we also have to thank Redstone. I mean, Redstone was part of uh, this whole MetaMask and PNV thing. Just saying, you know, putting that out there, we can continue. <laughs> no, 
Thank you, Romain, for telling for telling us this. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you to Redstone for, for making this possible. My bad on forgetting that. And to your point, Andres, the next piece of news or next pieces of news focused on exactly what you touched. Removing the friction and making it easier for people to use the project. So the next section of news fo focuses on the documentation efforts and the tutorial efforts that the various projects have actually started building. So as an example, we have Bundler who started out the year strong. They revamped their docs. They start the new YouTube channel where they're posting tutorials, making it easy for people to use their SDK, making it easy for people to use, build using Bundler. And the second one we have is for from our Academy. It seems that the core team, our drive app and MetaWeave team have just released new highly anticipated content. So be sure to check them out. And one more thing which I missed, but is also important for Bundler, they're also gifting a series of special New Year's NFT for people who start viewing their tutorial and answer a quick, short quiz. So be sure to get them start to get looked at and get started on building with Bundler and with the rest of the projects. Now, Andres, I'm curious of how you see the, the problem of documentation and tutorials from your perspective, from on what EXM is doing, how did you tackle the problem of documentation? Because as we all know, documentation and tutorials is essential for any new projects to get people onboarded, to get people start with building on them and so on. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's a question that always comes up within developers, you know, how do I do this? Um, oh, this, this lacks documentation, I don't know what's going on here uh, you know we developers we would always come into those questions um more often that that i would have liked um with the exam in the, like for example with with the exam we've always strived to have really good really steady um up-to-date documentation and i can tell you the the more your project grows, the harder it gets to maintain. Even though we're always striving to have like really good documentation, there's always something that's missing. There's always something new that wasn't added. And there's always like a question by the users that wasn't answered by the documentation. And this will happen. Um, but it's, I think like the way I would put it, it's really good to see other projects like Bundler rewriting their documentation because this tells Two things. This tells, first of all, that Bundler is growing and that they're getting more developers and that they're more serious about their documentation, more serious than ever. The second thing that it tells us is that the RF ecosystem is growing as well. I think but what we're going to see, and this is, a, I guess, an advice for all the projects that are here listening um, and, and have some sort of um, developer SDK API, I think documentation is the number one thing that you should never underrate. And, you know, that was a, a mistake in the beginning of EXM. We didn't really have good documentation. And we're like, oh, no, it's fine. You know, we're just studying, whatever. And then we had to rewrite everything. Like all the documentation, we spent days rewriting it just because it wasn't good. It wasn't, it wasn't answering any questions for our users. Not even for us. Sometimes we would, we would, you know, add, wonder something, and we didn't have like the answer in the documentation. We forgot to put it when we released the version, and we had to go back to the code and read through the code. This happens. It happens more often than than it should. So, documentation in our weave. Um projects in our weave, I think you know, from the very first moment, do the documentation. These efforts by the Bundler team, um, as I mentioned, regarding the documentation, pushing it um, to, a new, to a new limit, pushing it to, to more users, I think it's really good. It'll bring growth um, to the, not, not only Bundler, to the RWF ecosystem. And I think that's a good indicator about the current stage of, of the RWF ecosystem. How many projects are in the RWF ecosystem? How many of them have good documentations? Because my first impression when I go to 
like a, I don't know, a framework, an SDK, an API, and it lacks documentation, or I don't understand it well, I either think it's not reliable or I think it's dead and it's not maintained by anyone. So we don't want this, we don't, we don't want this impression for the RWF ecosystem. We don't want this impression for our projects. So definitely something to work on. Fully agree. And congrats on the documentation you have so far. I, I, I personally am new to the ecosystem. So I checked out your project. I looked at the documentation. It looks fantastic. And I would, I would have never guessed it wasn't as good in the beginning. So congrats on getting to this state. I think it was a huge effort, but it's definitely worth it. Thank you. Now, those were the news that we had in store for us today, but there's also one more topic. It's not news particular, uh, but it's something that we saw gaining traction in the ecosystem and something many projects and many individuals that are involved with our we've commented on. And it's a tweet from reka.eth, I'm spelling that right, who's questioning how many things she actually wants to be on chain permanently. And I think that's an amazing topic to discuss, especially since we're the ones that, that are fully on board with the perma web and with permanent storage. So I'm curious to hear what you, Romain, what you, Andres, Silvon, what your thoughts are on this. How many things do we actually want permanently stored on chain? Oh, that's actually, that's actually a good question. Um, I guess we can start off with that, yeah. Um, what, what, what do we want permanently stored? I mean, I'm guessing, you know, pictures, family, things like that. Um, but um, obviously, I guess it depends, really. Uh, what do we, I really don't care about my privacy, I guess it's bad to say, but I really don't. Um, so I, I guess I'm not a good person to ask. Um, Andres, what, what, what do you think of that? You know, my, my immediate response, and I haven't, I haven't given as much talk, it's a great question, I agree. My immediate response is we want to store as much as we can in chain. So everything you can store in chain really started. Um, but that, uh, that brings another question. How do we do this in a way that's comfortable, in a way that, that we can get used to, in a way that eventually everyone will be used to? And I'll put this example. When you go out of your house, when you go out of your place, you never forget your car keys. Maybe one time, but it's usually on you, right? You usually have it in your pocket or you usually pick them up by the door before you leave your house. So it's always, it's something that's just naturally part of you. It's something that, you know, you just do. You don't, you don't, you don't ask yourself or you don't tell yourself, oh, I have to pick up the car keys. So let me walk three steps and pick up the car keys so I can then go out of the door and, and get in my car. You don't do that. It's kind of like automatic. So I think like the same naturedness of, of that event, the same the same thinking needs to be applied to to what we call on-chain, to what we call the permaweb. I think we're still in a in a stage where mostly developers are working directly with the RBF ecosystem. Or mostly people that are somewhat experienced with Web3 terms, with blockchain terms, with NFTs. Um, so I think like in order for us to really answer the question, what do we need to start on chain? We really need to reach the masses. We need to reach not only the developers, not only the um, the the NFT community, not only the blockchain aficionates, not only, you know, not only these technical people in one way or the other, but we need to reach the masses, um, you know, the people in our communities, in, in our cities, in the big cities that don't really know about blockchain, don't really care about blockchain. They just care about having, first of all, a good user experience, second of all, a good product. What would be a good product in this case? I mean, it really sucks. I've lost my phone a thousand times and tend to lose the pictures with it um, until like two years ago, I decided to pay iCloud. So everything gets gets synchronized with, you know, with, with iCloud, with Apple. But before that, I wasn't doing that. 
So I think this brings up the question, how do we create some some level of desire for the people to to start these little things, you know, to start the, the picture they take at the coffee shop, to start the the family picture that they take during Christmas time, to start the, you know, all these things, all these things. And the question becomes relevant to what do we need to start in shame when we think about how unreliable um, a centralized server is, realistically. Just think about it. Um, no company, you know, no company will will be forever. Um, no server will be forever. So when you think about the chances of, you know, Facebook, for example, Facebook going down, and Facebook is now Meta, or yeah, but Facebook, the platform, they've been losing a lot of people, a lot of people from the year 2010. They've been losing a lot of people. I, I'm not saying they're going to close down, but I'm saying it's possible that at some point, 30 years in the future, Facebook is not what it is anymore. Or Facebook doesn't exist in the way it is. Or maybe some economical, you know, um, company war event between companies. I don't know. Something like that happens and Facebook stops existing. Now, all these pictures that are registered in Facebook, these, all, all these family pictures from the 2000s, the 2005, um, 2010, um, all this generation that used to use Facebook a lot. Now, what we are going to see is all these memories are gonna, could be wiped out. So that really brings the question about, you know, how do we want our memories to be safe? Especially if we have the technology to store our memories for good, if we have the technology to store our memories forever and pass it from generation to generation in a very technological, modern way, I don't think anyone would disagree with it. I don't think anyone would go against it. In the contrary, I think people would love it. People would love to to have the ability to, you know, save all these memories forever and kind of like be connected to it in in one way or the other. But we need to we need to really work on the process of how do we make this and how do we reach the masses. Um, and I, you know, I've heard crazy ideas about having like, and, and I know this sounds crazy, <clears throat> but I've heard crazy ideas, as I said, out there from the RV people, from, from the communities, from other ecosystems even, about having like um, DNA chips that connect with a wallet and they store all your pictures and stuff like that and, and they're decentralized so they're secure. It's it's all privacy and there's a way to like, you know, hold your memories forever. It's really interesting to see, but it's... But wait, like, wait, wait, wait. Here, the, the, here's the question though. What do we want on chain permanently, right? What do we want? So you said pictures, right? Like, give me, give me like five things, like, or you know what? Give me what we don't want. Just real quick, like, what don't we want on chain, like, permanently, forever, for like ten thousand years on our reef? What do we don't we want? Yeah, what what would we not want on on chain? Like, what, that's that's basically the question. I think you you never want your 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 bad memories, but uh, you know you you never want to to remember the, the those bad things that could have happened to you. But in general, as I said in the beginning, I, I I'd go with the with the answer of we want to store as much as much as we can, whether that's picture, whether that's, that's videos, whether that's um, documents of our job, whether that's um, you know a cooking recipe, everything. I, I'd say everything. Um, yeah. Has to, okay. So, so basically, you don't want you don't want things like you know, like maybe someone's nudes on it or anything. You know, obviously that type of stuff you don't want. Um, but now, obviously, you know, this is something I guess that you know for future conversations. But it's um, that's a that's a difficult one. What do we want? What do we want? I guess we'll we'll see uh, in the future. But now, Andres, are you ready to go into the depths of this? Because I don't know anything. Remember that I do not know a single thing. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, you better be. All right, so I want a brief, a very brief description of what EXM is and how it works. I want a brief one. I, I don't know anything. 
I don't know anything. So no, no depth, no depth terms, nothing. I don't know any. I'm, I'm new, completely new. I want to know from A to Z. But um, let's just start with A first before we go to B and C. Awesome. EXM is a developer platform that enables other developers from any ecosystem that only are with to deploy um, this concept of serverless functions that bridge data um, from Web2 to Web3 to Warweave. So it's basically you are able to programmatically create code that can process, receive, process, and send data into the blockchain, which you can then lazy evaluate. So you can create these permanent applications in a way um, because you're always going to be able to to synchronize with Arweave and fetch the data and get all the results um, as the request or originally came to what's called the serverless function to your application. Okay, can you give me a, like a little example of, you know, because you said Web 2 and Web 3 and whatnot. Can you give me like a little example of how you would get to this to, to actually be done? Like any real world situations? <laughs> Absolutely. So one, one, one of the things that we're, we're, we've been observing right now is, you know, the friction lines of having a wallet application installed in your browser and having a Rift tokens, for example. On the, fir on, on the first one, you have the, you know, the situation that not many people know how to use a wallet when we refer to the masses. Um, not many people want to use a wallet when we refer to people from like Web2. Um, and now many people have a wallet installed when we refer to, you know, just the, the common public. And then on the second side, you have like the Arweave token. It's just really hard to get Arweave tokens. One of the mm -hmm. things EXM solves for is you don't need, if, as, a, as a user or as a developer, you don't need a wallet or you don't need Arweave tokens to interact with EXM. Um, no one, really. Um, matter of fact, users in EXM can can interact with these applications without holding an EXM account. Now, going back to your question of the of the use cases, one thing that we're we're seeing right now is we're seeing a spike in interest for decentralized databases in a way. So it means that there's applications out there that we know of on the EXM ecosystem that are using EXM to receive and store data and index it and create these decentralized databases on top of Arweave. So Arweave is always going to be the layer down that's holding this data, but EXM is capable of, um, through, you know, through these programmatic applications, EXM is capable of indexing and organizing that data in the way the developer wants it. So we're seeing a spike in interest of like, things that require some sort of decentralized database, um, such as, um, you know, a decentralized social media, a decentralized newspaper, a decentralized forum. Um, we're seeing a lot of use cases in, in, in these specific um, categories. Okay, perfect. All right, that was, uh, that, was that was pretty good. Now, how did you come up with this idea? You know, what, what made you come up with this idea about you know, EXM? What made you build it? And uh, yeah, you know, just a little bit about that. Yeah, I think like, you know, everything started with 3M. 3M was the question as, uh, as to 3M, this runtime for for a smart contracts on Arweave, it started as the question of how do we solve for the security issues that could happen in a smart contract on Arweave? How do we solve for the efficiency? How do we make smart contracts on Arweave run really fast? Um, how do we make smart contracts able to be programmed in multiple languages. So we went ahead and we created 3EM. Um, and 3EM, you know, solved for all these things. Then the question was, okay, we have a smart contract on our brief, but then again, we have all these, you know, we have all these ecosystems, we have all these masses, and they don't want to have our with tokens. They don't want to have a wallet. How do we reach these masses that are out there and, 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 and they, do, they just want to have the same process as any other application. So we were really thinking about a Web2 mindset in a way. How do we bridge a Web2 mindset to a Web3 mindset? Um, so we came up with EXM, this idea for developers to deploy applications, really. And if there's developers here, you're familiar with um, AWS Lambda, for example, the serverless functions 
um, on AWS. So we were like, okay, how do we make these applications? How do how do how can we integrate this in Arweef in a way that any developer, where that's Web two, where that's Web three, where it's a developer from the nineties, where it's a developer from the eighties and have encoded for the past you know forty years or so, how do we how do we how do we do this? So we came up with the idea of abstracting all the wallet concept, all the Arweef um, token concepts in such a an easy way to get started. You know, you as a developer, you just deploy your application. Your application has a specific URL and users can interact with your application through a URL. So it behaves like like an API in a way. Um, and, and the mindset has always been, you know, the how do we how do we make it easy? How do, how, how do we reach the masses out there? Um, not only the Web3 developer, but the developer that's been programming in, in Web2 and heard something about Arweave, entered of something, and wants to get started without going through acquiring Arweave tokens and connecting a wallet and so on and so forth. Mm, okay. Um, okay, I guess that was a pretty, pretty in-depth in depth explanation of that. And from that, um, it goes to say that there is more and more traction, uh, or at least you know we're seeing there's more traction for uh, EXM. Um, I saw that last week, and I refused to read about it because I was like, "Look, And Andres is going to be on today, so I'm going to ask him directly." Uh, now, uh, since uh, Silophone is on, um, let's cover a little bit of the work that uh, Descentland has been doing on their rewrite on Arc V2. I'm assuming or I believe rather, uh, Molecule and Sender. Uh, so is there anything that Xylophone you would like to add on to this? You know how EXM is uh, helping with all this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so the, the, I guess the funny description of it being, you know, walletless is, 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 is interesting in that we, we try and make our like implementations um, of EXM like very walletful, <laughs> um, in the sense where it's like necessary for 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 Arc protocol to like know what um, someone's wallet is, and and it almost you know cares cares vastly about um, your identity. Um, and so while EXM can be um, a way to interact with Arweave or any chain really, um, sort of without actually having to. Um, you know, connect your wallet to it. It can also be um, used to detect what wallet you are connecting um, via, you know, any chain. And so Decent Land's molecule is like a way that we have expanded on the, um, the EXM standard, really, to basically expose functions where you can sign your, um, you know, sign this EXM transaction using MetaMask, um, connected to, uh, you know, any EVM chain, or you can sign it with an ICP wallet, or you can sign it on NIA. Um, and so basically what it makes example is like, you know, a, a, a way to uh, almost like a chain agnostic smart contract system that can be signed with anything. And what that naturally lends itself to um, for us building ARC out um, is a way to um, grab anybody's, grab any sort of person that is interacting with the contract's wallet address um, and tie it to any other wallet address. And so originally what we had done with with Arc, um, we'd kind of, this was before EXM existed, I think we started building Arc. Um, and, and what we had done was, uh, it's quite complex, really. I mean, we had, we'd made it so that everything settles back to Arweave. Um, we had deployed oracles on a whole bunch of different EVM chains, um, and non EVM chains, um, and and sort of made it so that all of these things speak to each other um, via a central node. And we actually, you know, we've we've come to realize it's actually not necessary to do that. Um, with EXM, you can you can sort of skip that and and have it so that a signature on one chain can just you know imply ownership from 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 the the signer who has then signed with a different wallet on another chain. And there's not actually the need for all of this like extremely complex <laughs> architecture um, and so so what we are doing is is what we'll actually achieve 
for the end user on uh, for this rewrite um, from from Arc V two to I guess what will now be Arc V three will be um, any address can be your master key. So right now everything settles back to your R weave address as the master key, but you could actually have it. So if you only wanted to link your Tezos address with your Ethereum address, say you're a creator on Ethereum who wants to do a drop of NFTs to a specific group of people on Tezos, and you want them to be able to prove that, yes, I'm this Ethereum address, but I also, on Tezos, um, I'm, I'm this address, whitelist me, um, then it would be possible for you to just set up that particular two-way interaction there um, and it's like one way rather than like, you know, having to have an Arweave wallet and settle everything back to Arweave that. Um, and oh. so, yeah, it, it's like really, really flexible. Um, and and it's, it's, it's allowed a lot more than we imagined it would. Um, and so, yeah, we, we're kind of having to rewrite everything just because of how good it is. <laughs> Oh, huh, okay. Um, did you state the advantages, by the way? Like, what, what, why, why EXM? By the way, I don't, I don't know if you, if you went over that. I mean, you did cut off a little bit for me, um, so maybe I, I, I skip that part. Yeah. But no. Why? I mean, so, so uh, I guess for us, it was like why EXM over vanilla smart weave, and that's like yeah, really yeah, yeah. obvious. Or, or work. Or work. Or like, you know, I, yeah, d d I think Darwin would have to be on here to talk about the Y over warp component. I reckon it's to do with the deterministic fetch feature of EXM, which, like Andres said, it's 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 basically like you can call any API from inside a smart contract. Um, okay, cool. So that's, that, that's, is, that, that's basically the, the, the response, right? It's just you can call any API easily. That's that's basically, I guess, the short answer, right? Pretty, pretty much, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the short answer. <laughs> All right, cool. I like that. You know what? I think that's what I'm going to take from it. Just it's really, you know, it's easy to call things. Sorry about the you know, kid in the background. Um, so, all right. Off to that, what are your favorite projects being built on EXN? Uh, Silophone or Andrew? Andres, you can both go for this one. I want to know what, what are your favorite projects? Yeah, I, obviously I have to using say, EXN. I have to say, one of my favorite projects right now is. You know, everything that these online guys um, are doing um, from, you know, when I, when I first saw Molecule, it had like, Molecule is this framework created by this one for, for the exam. When I first saw it, it only had like two modules, um, just two individual things that you could do with it. And it was really nice to see. It was um, really, you know, reassurance for the exam about going the right way. But then... I look at Molecule today, and it's like this massive framework with like over 15 modules, and it allows developers to do so much, like authentication from inside EXM, um, which is, you know, just really cool to see and really organic. Um, and um, we just got the news, you know, about all these migrations being done not just, but, you know, we've been getting all this news about all these migrations being done to to EXM. And it's just really nice to see in terms of it's using all the different features that EXM provides and it's using EXM in production. So, I mean, that kind of, you know, puts it in, in a way that I can say those are my favorite applications. Um, <clears throat> now, there's definitely other projects that we're really closely working with um, to get something up and running and really, you know, powerful, powerful things out there for the RWIF ecosystems. Um, right now, we, you know, we have a partnership with 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 DV, and we're trying to we're trying to really improve that partnership for all the people in the in the RWIF ecosystem. And the different developers, um, just you know, from any ecosystem, from any from any category, really, to create a really powerful decentralized database, um, EXM power module. Um, so you know, it's something that we're really interested in seeing, and um, it's definitely interesting to see how it will play out. So, yeah, in short, you know, those are my my favorite two applications out there um, that are somewhat using EXM, such as WebDB. 
And I'm really excited to see what's gonna what's gonna come out of it, because we're really putting putting an effort to to you know to reach the masses in that sense. And I have to interject here. It's amazing. We're not called are we news for nothing because we're tracking all the projects in the ecosystem. And we have to say it's amazing how fast things are evolving. Meaning, Andres, if I'm not mistaken, the official launch of EXM was in October, right? In just one or two months, Molecule SH launched. And you basically got your first developer tooling built on EXM. And it's just a couple of months. And as you said, there's already 15 libraries or 15 uh, methods that you could call out of molecule.sh. And I've, I personally was very uh, amazed at what they did with the AI features, because you can now call chat GPT and GPT-3 using molecule SH and EXM. Yeah, and this opens, you know, it, it really opens a lot of things. I'm a very skeptical person in terms of all the things that I see. Um, I, I like seeing the growth, but it's, you know, I think skeptical just to to be really focused and, and you know, um, no lose track, I guess. But seeing all this organic growth, it's just hard to be a skeptical against. Um, there's There's been a lot of organic growth um, on the EXM side. Um, you know, just take it, Molecule. You know, it has all these modules. It's, it's constantly being maintained. Um, and all the different projects that, for example, this one is working on. Um, they have their user and it's constantly being maintained, it's constantly um, being, you know, it's constantly getting this growth. So it's hard for me to stay skeptical with organic growth. I'm just, you know, I'm really proud of everything that we've done at EXM, the team, um, because we've seen all this organic growth and it's really a confirmation uh, of the path we're taking. So, for example, we we shot GPT inside of, of the EXM. It really opens a lot of doors when you think about it. I cannot help but think, how will the permaweb feed the next data set for AI? And how are we doing it right now? So, you know, it's really interesting. Like when you see all this organic growth, the conversation can take really interesting path. Andres, I've got something actually that I wanted to, I don't, don't know whether I've told you, but we probably should do. Um, so De- Decent Land is making a um, an a NFT standard um, on top of Enic, on top of EXM, which will be used um, for the launch of ANS domains. Um, and what we what we're going to be able to do is like kind of pare that down a little bit and like remove some of the specifics around like you know subdomains and all of the kind of noise that someone might not need. Um, but what it will turn into is a way to actually use EXM to mint NFTs. And that would be able to be done like cross chain using any wallet to mint it to and from. Um, and yeah, that that's, I guess if, if the question is like, what are you excited about that's being built on EXM? I would say I'm personally really <laughs> excited about the thing that we're, that we're building there um, to, to build a cross chain NFT standard um, using EXM. That's amazing. I mean, you see, we need more of these spaces. I'm just finding out about this, and it's more organic growth, more confirmation. Um, really wait, wait, wait. Did you say an, a cross-chain NFT standard? Did, did I hear that right? Yes, that, in, in, in the sense that you, yeah, in the sense that you would be able to mint um, an EXM asset to 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 any wallet. Um, since since EXM is able to be like signed by any wallet. You would then be able to, like, you know, and and, and using EverPay, in fact, um, you'd like that, mm-hmm. Romain. Uh, you can pay with I'll the native help. token. <laughs> you can pay with the no- native token of that chain, and so it kind of like makes chain agnostic NFTs that are able to be, um, you know, minted with whatever wallet, paid with whatever token, um, standard stored on the exam. Oh, cool. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to really dig deep into EXM uh, this week and actually uh, really really get familiar with everything. Um, like, there, I mean, if not, I could probably have Andres here for like a couple hours. Oh, you know, you can. Yeah, I'm down for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but any anyway, anyway uh, do we have any questions for Andres? Do we have any questions at all? 
Es que mi amor. I said that. Sorry, I said that uh, without the mic. I'm definitely I'm waiting for, for some questions, so ask anything. EXM related, not EXM related. Glad to answer. Yeah, anyone who does anyone here have a question? Let's see, we have Justin here, we have Oliver. Um, anyone have a question about EXM? And I guess how they can, uh, you know, I don't believe in competition. And uh, I think, or actually, you know, I think competition is good. So even if, if uh, I guess, warp is the same as EXM, if you wish, which is not, um, I think it's always a good thing to, to, to have that type of stuff. Um, so, yeah, does anyone have any sort of questions? If not, we'll get on to the next part, and then uh, we'll wrap it up here. Well, I do have a question for, for Andres. Uh, while we're waiting for questions from the audience, and that's, what are your plans for 2023? How do you see the project evolving? How do you see XM growing? Yeah, um, that's a question, you know, I I even wonder myself in terms of when you're an early stage of startup, you're always, you know, you're always looking for, for, for what's, what's to come. Um, you don't necessarily think about long-term, but you think about small wins. Um, what I really want to see, though, for 2023 is I want to see more adoption on the company side. So right now we have a, a user base, um, most of individuals, so individual developers um, that are using EXM. But we want to see, in a, I personally want to push for a growth on the company side, so, you know, more company projects. Uh, more projects on the RWIF ecosystem or outside of the RWIF ecosystem using EXM in one way or the other. Um, I personally want to see and watch that kind of growth. Now, <clears throat> there's a few things that we also want on the, on the technical side, for example. Um, there's, you know, EXM is at, a, at an early stage. And even though it's, it's powerful as it is right now, it has, you know, it's it's um this journey of creating a product, it never ends. You're always improving. So one of the things that we want to see for EXM this year is the ability for developers to, you know, to be able to detect errors in their applications, to be able to debug their applications. And with that, you know, we want to, and, and we have some plans, we have some plans. We have some designs there, some some exciting stuff coming this year, um, such as a, a user dashboard, where users will be able to like interact with their functions, or developers will be able to get a, a statistics of their functions. Um, so we have a few things, but I'd say the main things for 2023 is expanding into uh, more companies, more more are with projects, even that, um, or I'll say projects, but companies in general. And we want to make the, the developer experience much better than it is right now. We acknowledge there's some flaws in the developer experience because we've put too much time into making it easy for the user. But perhaps, you know, with putting too much time into making it easier for the end user, um, we have degraded the developer experience for the specific developer. Um, so we're definitely going to improve that. We're going to be working on that. So, so you want to find kind of like a little balance point between um, devs and users, right? That's Correct. kind of, or you, or, you, or you see that you're lacking on the dev part. But I mean, it, user is very, very important. I think it, in general, the RV ecosystem lacks like user experience. You know, not just one project, but I think it's like the whole ecosystem. Um, just, just getting into the ecosystem is a bit of a headache. You know, I think we talked about it, getting AR and whatnot. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's all a balance, right? Because um, like developers want their users to be successful at user and at using their applications, but developers also want to consider the easiest option to develop on. So we definitely want to make EXM easier than it is right now for developers. All right, perfect. That's what I like to hear. Uh, Justin, I see you have a little question here. Put your hand up. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, nice to finally uh, meet you, Andres. Um, yeah, so I got a couple things. Um, you, you guys were talking about what are the things that you, you wouldn't want on-chain, potentially. 
uh, earlier and I had I had a thought. It's funny because I was in uh, I was just I just got back from New York and I was speaking with the uh, DMAC, Tom from Permage Pages and uh, uh, Vince or sorry, Nick from uh, Alex. And we were talking about this exact concept. And, and one thing that came up is I've been working on this little tool called Permal Pals, which is just like a really easy way to keep track of users that you follow and, and could be useful for um, getting content from those people. But DMAC made a good point, which is that, hey, I don't really think I want to keep my follow list on chain. And one of those reasons would be like, hey, I, I, I'm going to a job 10 years from now and I go to this job and, and they, they look at my on-chain history of people that I've followed and for whatever reason, maybe I don't get the job. And I think that's a pretty good reason for not putting a follower list on chain or, or, or having something built for followers on cha off chain. Uh, but so then then my second point is that um, so I, so I'm really excited for EXM. I've been going back and forth with Andreas and I'm, I'm looking for a specific feature, which would be the ability to have to inject private keys um, as environment variables in a secure way. Um, and then so I, I think this is really powerful um, and I'm, I'm looking to use this specific use case to. Um, deploy a function that will archive anything on the internet. So I just put out an API for archiving websites on the internet. And it's basically a clone of archive forever from uh, Dabit three or Nader. Um, so the idea would be like, Hey, I want the user, but I also want people, I want users to, to be able to pay for these artifacts. If, like if they want to attach a truth mechanism to it. So user pays. Um, so I, I'm using two things. One is, I think it's going to work. I'm not sure. So may maybe this won't work out in, in the long run. But one is the foreign call protocol. So I want to be able to have a user uh, send some something, whether it's a burned R or whatever, to a contract as a claim to the private key that's in this function. And then that function would check and make sure that that user, that user address has a claim or there's a claim waiting for... Um, um, f to be to be claimed by the function, the the address in the uh, function, the private key in the function, uh, before archiving that data, so that it sort of moves the payment for archiving data to the user, and then they can choose uh, whether or not they want to do that. But but yeah, so that that's something that I'm going to be trying to build into Permafax as it scales, and uh, I'm really excited to start working with the XM. Yeah, no, uh, Permafax. Permafax with EXM, let's go. That's that's really great to hear. Um, you know, um, as as the founder of EXM and representing the, the the people that we have behind working on EXM as well, I can tell you, you know, we we're very excited to to support these these sort of partnership of Permafax using EXM in any way. So you know, feel free to always ping me. For, for more technical questions for, for anything EXM related in that sense. We'll be here, we'll be there to help. Thank you, sir, appreciate it. And I have one question here for you guys, and it's for the whole group and the audience per se, because Justin's point was an interesting one, right? You maybe not, maybe you won't, don't want your followers visible on and stored forever on the Paramount web. But the question is, is it the fact that you don't want them stored on the Paramount Web forever? Or is it the fact that you don't want them publicly stored? Because I think that's where the distinction goes. Uh, I'm one of those digital hoarders, which never deletes any message, never deletes any email. Perhaps I'll need something. And I love having that, that history of what I did, what I, whom I talked to, what I achieved in a particular year. And I'd like to have it 100 years from now if I'm going to be alive. or I, want to have it for my kids to see it. But of course, I don't want all of that being public to the world. It, and I think that's an important distinction we have to make. And I'm curious about your opinion as well. I'd like everything for them on the web, but some of it public, some of it private. What What is your guys' take on this? Yeah, I'll step in. I, I think this is a really good point. And it's one of the... It doesn't seem like it's, it seems like a really ambiguous problem, uh, but to users that are going to be onboarded to Arweave, the first question they're going to ask is, well, I don't want to, you know, how do I make sure I'm 
storing publicly what I want to store publicly and not. Like, I think this is the first question that they're going to ask. And they might not even say that that's, that's a question. They might just, um, they might just like subconsciously say, I'm not going to do this because of this and then just move on without letting people know that this is important. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think that's a really important problem that the ecosystem should, should keep on the back of their minds and try to solve going forward. I agree. I think we haven't appreciated enough the, you know, the need for, for, a smooth encryption because when you think of encryption you think of this you know cryptographic mathematics thing you think of you know you need to be a developer to encrypt it and send it to the perma web so if there's an opportunity to improve that if there's an opportunity to have public and private data on our with the question will be will come down to how does the regular user you know that that person that doesn't know anything about computers, that doesn't even know how to turn on a computer, how do we reach that person and make an application in such a way that can have two categories, like public and private data, and in such a way that's encrypted, and in such a way that doesn't require much knowledge to de-encrypt that information after you download it from the Perma web. So those will be relevant questions for this issue. I agree. I'd like an easy switch. This is public, this is private. I don't think we're there yet, but I think with the growth of our weave and with our user coming along, I think it, it's going to be an important topic and something we definitely need projects to solve for, right? Making sure sensitive data is private, making sure whatever I share, whatever I like, whatever content I produce is public. And I think it's something that the ecosystem as a whole should take upon itself to solve for. Because if we really want users to come in and say, or we've is the de facto solution from now on for me, we need to give them the choice of what is public and what is private. Especially since everybody's talking about privacy these days and everybody's panicked about what the big web two companies are doing with their data. Uh, you, you said something about, um, you know, someone who hasn't turned on their computer or hasn't turned on their computer, hasn't turned on a computer, actually. Um, and, and you know, how would they be able to use this? Like, are we even even close to being to that point where like someone from their phone can just, you know, do it? I know AR Drive has like their app so that, but it's not, uh, I guess it's not easy to use for now. Um, again, you, you need the AR, you need the AR token in order to actually be able to use that anyway. Um, so, I mean, what would even, how can we even do that? How can we make it so someone who has never turned on a computer, how can, we, how can we make it so that they can use this? I think what we're going to, what we should do, or what developers should start doing, is having our brief not as an outside concept, but as an integrated concept. What do I mean by this? Um, you know, if you buy an electronic, you don't have to plug the cables. You know, you don't have to do all the chips and stuff. It already has it. So you don't worry about that. You, when, you, when you touch your laptop, you're not like, oh, this cable goes from the microchip to the, to the RAM. And so that, that's why it works. And I need to make sure this works. You're not like that. You just, you know, you just turn on your laptop. You don't worry about that. So in the same way, I think of a far wave taking the next step to reach the masses in that way. Our wave needs to be not a concept we acquire, not an application we use, not a platform we talk about, but something that's integrated in our devices. Think of, the, mm -hmm. uh, of it this way. Imagine Chrome, Google Chrome, but it, when you download it, it already has our wave integrated. No wallet, no, none of that are with itself integrated so that people can upload their pictures, you know. Like when you, when you right-click on a picture, it'll have an option instead of like save as, it'll have an option upload to our with, something like that. But it's already integrated. People don't need to know what, people wouldn't need to know what our with is or how it works because it's already in the system you're using. So I think that's the next uh, approach we need to take. Um, 
we need to take the existing applications, the existing operative systems, and we need to make them, um, you know, first-hand providers of, of the Arwif platform. Hmm, that's actually, uh, can that actually be possible? And would, it be, would there be negatives to that? Like, I mean, if you upload to Arweave, it's forever on Arweave, right? Like, you can't delete it. So what if you, you, I don't know, what if you misclick or something? I mean, there's many, there's so many things to, to, to go over. Um, I guess we'll have to just see if that can be a, a thing. Um, so, yeah. All right, so I, I'm assuming there's no more questions for today. Um, Henry, would you like to go on with uh, section three? Absolutely. So thank you. Section three is all about the Arweave's voice contest. And this for the past two weeks, we had a session going. And for this session, we have asked our followers to write or ask questions on some of our news. And today we're going to be awarding the prize to one great submission that came from Mo Crypto. So to give you guys a bit of context, and you can also find it in the chat, uh, our own colleague, AZ, wrote a great piece about how blockchain could avert a gaming industry disaster. The whole thing revolves around how today, every piece of game that you digitally buy is stored on a server somewhere with electronic arts, with PlayStation, with Xbox, with Microsoft, and so on. And if any of these services were to go down, or to see as existing in 10, 20, 30 years from now, basically your well-spent money and your uh, games would be gone forever. And Mold actually pointed out something interesting, that we're already experiencing the disappearance of legacy games and TV shows because they're now inaccessible due to the links, due to platforms going down, and so on. So we're losing a bit of our culture every single day. And I think that's a very powerful thing for Arweave, because with Arweave, you don't lose your history, you don't lose your culture, you don't lose your, your memories. And he mm. actually posed an interesting, interesting question for us. And I want to ask you guys, um, how many of your book bookmarks don't actually work anymore? How many sites that you used to frequent in your youth or in previous years have gone down and you're missing them? I'm going to have to check that, actually. Good question. There's a bunch of, like, Wikipedia dead links as well, like, in the sources section of an article that was written, you know, years ago, um, maybe not even that many years ago. Um, where, you know, the, the related reading or the references and sources are all dead. Um, and yeah, I, I've got a ton of bookmarks that are dead. Um, but it, some of them I was smart enough to go and opt in to put them on Arweave. And now I guess that's kind of like the thing that we're all getting at, right? It's like, do we, do we, uh, I mean, should we be using a default rather than opting in? If you ask me, I would say yes. But again, I'm a data hoarder, so I'm not sure if, if my opinion is for everyone. But yeah, but the thing is, that, that then again, it goes to the, you know, do we want, I guess it goes back to that question, do we want things, you know, what do we want permanently stored on, on chain? And once, once it's on chain, we can't really do anything about it. So, I mean, there's definitely, we definitely need to find that, that sweet spot, I guess, into what we want, what we don't want. But if we don't want it, how do we make it so it's not on there? I mean, yeah, I guess that's a little dilemma there. That, that in itself is like a, you know, it, it's a very difficult question because you would need the foresight required to store something just as you would need the foresight required that you would need to eventually delete it. It's like, um, you know, there is a delete button on Twitter because you you know, might want to get rid of something you've said in the past. Um, you're not going to know that at the time because you posted it without that knowledge that you're going to want to get rid of it in the future. Um, the same way as, 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 as making a bookmark or saving a link on Web2, you don't know in the future that you are going to wish that you had actually put that on Arweave. And so it's sort of like we're, we're running without the foreknowledge. Um, and, and so the question's kind of almost unanswerable. But, you know, things should default to being 
stored permanently unless you might possibly want in the future to not and it's like that's kind of almost as close as you can get to an answer yeah do, do you think in the future that maybe they will implement something like that where you can actually get rid of things but then i guess that would just defeat the point wouldn't it it would be defeat the point of our wave now I was thinking about this and like how it could be done. I don't know. I mean, it would have to be done as like you signal to the miners that you want to encrypt the thing, I guess. And, uh, um, you know, after the fact you have it, you have it able to be encrypted, uh, but then whether they obey or et cetera, et cetera, it's like, it's very difficult. Um, I, 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 it does go against the, like the whole ethos of, are we really? Yeah. I mean, th then again, like imagine, I don't know, imagine there's, you know, war right now. <laughs> Ukraine versus Russia, obviously, and, you know, uh, they're, they're posting things and in the future you could just delete it, right? I mean, yeah, so it definitely does go against Arweave's, you know, whole point, but, and then again, what if we can't delete it? Yeah, so, I don't know, Andres, you had something to say, I saw. No, I was just going to say, it's a dead end, and so... Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's a dead end because if you, if you make a if you make the system in a way that things can be deleted, then the, th the the system, this platform, doesn't have any utility value because it becomes a regular, you know, Google Drive, really. And so if it doesn't have utility value, there's no incentive for, for miners to actually um, store the data. There's no incentive for the network at all to be part of the network. Um, in, yeah, that, that's just that part, but it also defeats the blockchain purpose. So it wouldn't be a blockchain anymore um, if, you, if you're able to delete data from the blockchain. It wouldn't be a blockchain anymore. Um, that's that part. Now, you, ha you also have the encryption part because like, we think, oh, okay, I can encrypt this file. Sure, you can. But what about if that encryption breaks in the next 20 years? It always happens. I mean, MD5 was one of the one of the most secure hashes algorithms in the past, and it was broken in 2005. That's why people prefer new new hashing algorithms such as SHA-256 right now. But MD5 used to be kind of like the de facto for many things. And since it was broken down in 2005, that was, you know, less than 20 years ago. So what I'm pointing out with this is encryption can be a solution for right now. But what about 30 years in the future? What about if, you know, if those algorithms we use for encryption get broken, then privacy is no longer private. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess, uh, like you said, I guess it's a dead end. But then again, um, are we what what it stands for? It's uh, you know, um, it's obviously a good thing. I think this is why everyone or everyone here believes in Arweave. So, conclusion is, yeah, I guess you know we we need it. We need to have it permanent. And you know what? Now that I think about it, you know, sometimes people like uh, Silophone, you said, um, you know, sometimes people post things on Twitter and whatnot, and then like you know they want to delete it because I don't know. Maybe people don't like it and they just, you know, regret it and they don't want to be canceled or something. Maybe I guess it's a good idea to just not have it deleted. So people could always see, you know, okay, this person said this and then I guess they can apologize. I don't, I don't know. Um, hmm. Yeah. Then that's you maybe drive users to a more ephemeral, um, you know, place to post their thoughts. Like, you know, the whole selling point behind Snapchat. Hmm. Like I guess, huh? That's a that's a good one. Unless you have anything for that one, I want to hear what you have to say about that. What was the question again? Sorry. Essentially, that if you were to, you know, be promoting some kind of permanent um, social speech tool, for example, um, you would almost then be pushing for users to go to a separate place where it is not permanent um where you can delete these things and say if it became prevalent and normal the are we would be the place where you do your speech um but then like romaine said maybe it's better 
um, you know, that people are accountable for what they say um, and, uh, you know, that that's the, the things that they've said that may, may get them cancelled or whatever in the future are still there for posterity. Um, but then what you do is you create a market for a more ephemeral um, sort of, uh, you know, speech platform. Uh, and that I think typified, is typified by like the existence of Snapchat, right? And so that, that, that came out of the very private, very limited, very like a- absolutely opposite are we if things get deleted on purpose after a period of time, uh, after one view, um, uh, you know, you, you can't save them for the future. And there is almost like a, you know, a human need for this and the, the very existence and prevalence of Snapchat when it was around sort of speaks to this desire for non-permanence. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And this is a long conversation. Um, when, when we come about, you know, um, like the speech, like what speech do we want to be permanent and what speech do we not? That's a long conversation to be had. But I think, you know, I think you can, I think you can have both. You can, I think you, um, you can have permanent speech, um, public speech, and you can also have consequences at the same time. So I don't think it contradicts. I think it actually complements. I think it's kind of. It, I'm sorry, Romania. It looks like you're speaking. No, I'm not speaking. Maybe it's just a Twitter bug. There's there's so many Twitter bugs with the spaces. So yeah. <laughs> no. Anyway, I'll uh, I'll I'll let up because um, as Andre said, this is a super long topic. I've got to resist from going off on another tangent. So <laughs> I would have loved to hear it, but <laughs> I guess so. But anyway, um, this was a great space. Uh, I learned a little bit about EXM. I'm gonna have to dig a lot deeper into to seeing what you know how how it can be used. Um, the cross chain, all of that good stuff. Um, so yeah, does anyone else have a last last minute comment to to make? If not, I guess we'll just you know wrap things up. Henry, what do you think? I think we're ready to wrap it up. But <clears throat> before that, I just have to say that we're not going to stop, and that in a couple of weeks we're going to have the next Twitter space. We're going to have an exciting guest join us, and the same goes for the Arweave's voice contest. A new edition is going to start, and we want all our followers, all our listeners to participate and stand a chance to win the prize. So thank you, everybody, for listening to us today. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Xilophone, for, for being here and for giving us this insightful conversation. I think we all learned a lot about the XM and about the problem of storing data forever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. I'm excited thank- to be there for next time and have all of you on again. Thank you so much oh, for having be, me. Be, before you leave, Andres, let me just one question. Are you, by any chance, going to East Denver? I might. I might. It's in the works. All right, right let's, change that. let's change that to I am going. Because let me tell you, we have every single person in the ecosystem that's going. right. And meeting you in real life would be, would be amazing. So, you know, obviously, maybe not you since, you know, I, you're probably the lead dev for, um, for EXM, but someone from your team, that would be, a, that would be fantastic. Uh, but if you're going, obviously, I would take that. Yeah, yeah, no, let's keep in touch. Perfect. Perfect. That's what I like to hear. All right. Well, anyway, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Um, like Henry said, we'll be back in about two weeks with another space with an exciting guest. And then we'll go from there. Thank you very much, everyone. Silophone, Andres, Henry, Permadown, and Army News, of course. Um, Damien, you know, you're always here. Perfect. Pierre, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Cheers.